know, I was going in, making the coffee, answering the phone, the machine, cleaning the tape decks, um, ordering pizza. It was, it started to build slowly, but I started feeling all this pressure about doing Siamese Dream because people were saying to me, oh my God, you're going to do the next Pumpkins record. It's going to be huge. And I'm like, <laughs> that's, that's really weird, right? And that, I haven't even, even heard any songs. You haven't heard any you know? songs. You're yeah. going to do this record. It's going to be huge. It, it was expectations. I mean, especially because Gish had done really well. Yep. And uh, I didn't like hearing that pressure. I sort of had to shut it out. And that it was one good thing about being in Madison. We could be sort of left to our own devices. You know, yep. living in LA or New York probably would have been tougher. But I, I didn't really like it. Uh, so I just sort of kept my routine. You know, I just stuck with recording smart. I, I already had a bunch of bands booked even before Nevermind took off, like a band called the Cosmic Psychos from Australia who were a hoot mm -hmm. and really fun. I did some more work with Killdozer. There was a band called Overwhelming Color Fast, I think was on Caroline Records that came in. And I had managers calling saying, you should be recording in New York or coming to LA. We can set you up with a room. You'll have your own studio. You'll only be working with A-list bands. You'll have the pick of the chair. You can <laughs> cherry pick any band you want to work with. I was like, mm, I'm happy here. It's smart, just doing my thing. So, but then you decided to come to Atlanta to do Siamese Dream. Why Atlanta of all places? Well, we had done Gish at Smart Studios in Madison. We decided we didn't want to do the second album there. We thought about going to New York, thought about going to LA, but then thought too many record people, too many distractions. We considered going to Ardent in Memphis, which yeah. I love the studio. I'd been yeah. in there before, but never recorded there. And we also flew up to Toronto and looked at some studios in Toronto. Okay. And then somehow out of the blue, someone suggested Triclops in Atlanta. And the reason we liked it was because it had a big tracking room. They had a vintage Neve console in there. Yep. We thought we would be kind of removed from any influence or any bad behavior. And a lot of that was because of Jimmy. We yeah. wanted to keep him on the straight and narrow path because mm -hmm. he had some issues back in the day. And within two days, I think every drug dealer in LA was making a path to Triclops and back, bringing these little briefcases in and walking out. So that kind of all went <laughs> out the window out. In, in, right. in, you know, on the second day. Because <laughs> you, you can find pretty much whatever you want in any city you go to. Yeah. You know? But the, the good thing was we were far removed from the record company, and I think that was just good for us to focus. You know, we really didn't do anything except go to the studio. You know, we would take initially the first three months, we would take sometimes a Saturday night off so people could go and have dinner. We would take Sundays off. But after about three months into the five months of recording, we realized we were way behind schedule. We worked seven days a week. I'd go in at like 11 or noon and work till two or three in the morning, seven days a week. Now, one of my best friends at the time, uh, Mark Richardson, who's no longer with us, he was owner of Triclops, one of the two owners of Triclops, and actually a very dear friend of mine, Dave Honorato, worked on the session as well. I have a picture of him, I showed it to Billy, of you and Dave and Billy playing together. Dave was playing guitar, and, or maybe playing bass, and you were playing drums, you were jamming after hours, but, and Billy told me that Mark, that you guys would jam with Mark as yeah, well. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Mark Richardson was fantastic. Uh, he was the coolest and nicest guy, and always, able to sort of bring some levity to the tension in the sessions, you yeah. know. There was a lot of tension um, between Billy and the rest of the band, and Darcy and James had been a couple, and I think they'd broken up, and Jimmy had some substance abuse issues and sometimes went missing from the studio, and it was fraught with anxiety, and um, Mark was great at helping to break that up. One day, Mark brought in this little silver box. He said, yeah, I took this little fuzz distortion out of a lap steel or a pedal steel and it's really low gain because the the input the impedance in the lap steel has hardly any output but he goes when you plug a guitar in it's really loud and billy plugged into the little box and plugged it into his marshall and it made this gigantic whoosh, like a airplane taking off it's just the most insane sound I'd like to take a second to talk to you about this channel. This is actually Rick Beato too. I've had it since the beginning of my main channel and many of you are not subscribed. As a matter of fact, 87% of the people that watch this channel regularly are not subscribed. So I encourage you to hit the subscribe button on this channel and on my main channel. 
This will help me get even more of my dream guests and help continue to grow both channels. Thank you. So this record ended up being a massively big record. When Billy came in, did you know that this was gonna be a big record? Well, getting back to what I was talking about, the pressure that we were starting to feel, I had gone down in the summer before we started the record to hang with Billy, mm -hmm. and he was gonna play me demos. And so I picked him up in my car, he hopped in, and we were driving around suburbs and neighborhoods of Chicago, and he'd play a song, I'd hear a little bit, and then he'd stop it. And they go, hmm, let me play something else. And I go, what's that called? And one of the songs was Rocket, I remember that. And he, and he played maybe five or six things, but he'd start playing things and then stop right away. And after about 45 minutes, I was like, you can just let it play, man. I'm, I'm not being critical. I just want to hear what you're doing. And he said, I'm not done writing. He said, I just realized playing all these songs for you, I'm not happy with where we are, and I need to write more. And that would have been another six months of hang time well, I just waited while he kept writing. In that six months, he wrote Today, Cherub Rock, and Disarm, at least those three, and Manies, I know, were all written in that, in that time going up to that, because he just felt like he had songs, but he knew that the whole record had to have great songs all the way through, and it had to have a kind of an epic feel to it. So I was cool, man, I just said, I'll just wait. So we. We had a studio on hold. I think it was Triclops, and we, I called and said, hey, can we put this on hold until we know we have the songs? And they're like, sure. You know, They were totally cool about it. So we just delayed it six months, and it was all for the better. So that record, massively big record. Now, did you think, how did this happen? Or just that, that these guys that you worked with, these bands just had amazing songs. I mean, what are the chances, right, that you have these huge records? back to back. Then you decide to start your own band right after that. I was just saying on our break that I saw you play with Garbage on your first tour at The Point in Atlanta. The Point, yes. And I stood right up in front, right very front of the stage, because yeah. I was like, I want to see Butch Vig play drums. I want to hear this band. I was so psyched. It was probably a bit of a mess. That was our first tour. <laughs> <laughs> We didn't really know how to deal with the technology on stage at that point, but it was interesting. The setup. My one of my best friends actually booked the club, booked the show, and I went down early during when you guys were setting up, and I was there kind of just watching the whole setup go down. So well, I I know the point very well. When we were finishing Siamese Dream, Billy decided let's go play a show, and. Um, Someone called the point and said, we decided to go play a show there. They decided to go play a show. And I, I helped, I think I mixed the sound from the soundboard. But mm -hmm. the funny thing I remember is that Billy said, here's a CD. I want you to play this before we go on. Only this and after, afterwards. So there may have been an opening band that played like 30 minutes or something. And it was, the place was packed. Mm -hmm. And I put the CD on and it said Mellow Yellow. It started playing. It was Donovan's Mellow Yellow. They call me Mellow Yellow. <laughs> Quite right. The song ends, comes on again. Da -da 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 -da. And people in the crowd go, hey, that's funny. And then the third time, I just put on all the loop. And it took like 40 minutes to get all the change over or whatever. And then people started getting kind of agitated. Okay. Like, okay, we don't want to hear Donovan again. But Billy was just like, just keep playing it. Um, it just seemed so funny. I, for some reason, those are the things I remember sometimes, Rick, like the anomalies, these weird sure. little moments. Yeah. And then they play this crazy, powerful show. The fans went crazy. And they played a lot of the new songs. Like now, nowadays, sometimes the labels don't want you to do that because no. you know people record it'll be them on, on the phone. It'll, it'll be, be on, on YouTube, YouTube the next yeah. day. They played a lot of the new songs on the record. And then the second it was done, Mellow Yellow came back on. <laughs> <laughs>